All right, this morning, as I've already mentioned, we're going to be looking at a few verses in the uh, letter to the Galatians. And uh, if I might just say, by way of uh, introduction, uh, I believe the Galatian church was established on the first missionary journey. And we see that as Paul finishes that journey and goes to uh, Antioch prior, I think, to the beginning of the second missionary journey, uh, there's this issue that arises. And those that were being addressed in uh, in Antioch uh, that Paul and Barnabas were facing off and defending the gospel against. It went up to Jerusalem. They had come to Galatia and were creating difficulties. And so Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians to establish them in the truth and to remind them of this truth. So let's, um, let's just, we're going to look just at the first 10 verses and um, see what it is that Paul has to say. But I do want us to see that he is here defending his apostleship. Uh, because it's important that they know who he is, who has sent him, so that they would, might, might know that, the, that what he is preaching is the truth as over against these Judaizers. So, begins in verse 1, Paul, an apostle not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed, as we have said before. So I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still striving, or if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Now, again, there's many things for us to look at here, so let's go ahead and uh, tie it to what it is we were looking at over the past six weeks. Galatians, I, I think I made reference to it before during that series, is one of the books of the New Testament that gives us the so what of the Reformation. You know, what difference does it really make whether we believe this, the truth as God reveals it to us in the Bible, or we choose to believe something else? Now, lately, uh, R.C. Was, was, was reminding us that, that many people, I think most people, uh, who have any understanding of or belief uh, in, in God and heaven and so forth, really don't think it matters what you believe. The vast majority of people in the world don't think it matters because, after all, isn't Everyone going to heaven, or, or if, if it's not everyone, at least most people, and the really bad ones are the ones that aren't going to make it. As R.C. put it in one of our Wednesday studies, he said, most believe not in justification by grace through faith alone, but they believe in justification by death. You just simply die to go to heaven. Well, Paul tells us it's different than that. It really does make a difference what we believe. Uh, we must believe the message that he preached. If we're not looking to Jesus and to him alone for our acceptance with God, we are not going to heaven. We are not safe. We're still under God's curse. And essentially, the whole human race is under that curse. We came into the world under that curse, the curse of the broken covenant uh, that Adam broke in the garden, what we call the covenant of works. And that curse is death. And the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. That brought death upon Adam, and it brought death upon the whole human race. So if we don't look to Jesus alone, we're still under that curse. And in the end, we will be condemned. Now, Paul had brought this gospel to the Galatians, and the Galatians had listened to Paul when he preached to them on that first missionary journey, and they had turned to Christ, but shortly after that, the Judaizers showed up. Again, Jews who believed Jesus was their Messiah, and they needed what Jesus had done. 
that both Jews and Gentiles needed that, but they also believed Jews and Gentiles still needed to be circumcised. They still needed to be uh, told to keep the law of Moses if they were to be justified, if they were to be saved, if they were to be accepted by God. Now, these same Jews also seem to have a very low view of Paul, which we see in the book. Now, their proselytizing, not only in Galatia, but also in Antioch, as I mentioned, was the reason for the Jerusalem Council that we read about earlier in Acts chapter 15. So, to win them back, literally to keep them from falling away, Paul needed to do two things. He needed to defend his ministry, and he needed to defend the gospel he was preaching. And, of course, by defending the first, that proves his authority, so they'll listen to the second the message that he brings. And so he begins by telling them why it is they should listen to him rather than to the Judaizers and why, of course, we should listen to to him and to what the messengers of our Lord Jesus Christ tell us as over against the many uh, so-called prophets who are in this world, so so many so-called false religions. And we should because he is an apostle sent by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word apostle essentially does mean one who is sent. And interestingly, the word missionary means exactly the same thing. Uh, You've heard the term missile, right? A missile is something that is sent, and it comes from the same root as the word missionary, one who is sent. Well, that's what an apostle was, is essentially a missionary. Jesus himself is a missionary sent from God into this world with the gospel, to preach the gospel, and to do what is necessary to make a gospel. And so he is called a missionary. He is called an apostle. And not just an apostle, he is called the apostle. We read in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Jesus was sent. He is an apostle. Uh, Paul had mentioned a little bit earlier here when he was talking about his own credentials that he wasn't sent from, you know, by man. Uh, There's another sense in which the word apostle is used, and it's referring to those who have been sent from a church in order to do missionary work, in order to uh, plant a church or to minister to a church. They are also called apostles. And in the more modern translations, it's translated a little bit differently just so we don't get confused. But the word is the same in the Greek. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brethren, they are messengers or they are apostles of the churches, a glory to Christ. So again, sent by the church to minister. They're called also missionaries or apostles. And, of course, there were those who were sent by Jesus himself, who were called apostles. Uh, Aside from Jesus, these were the highest kind of apostles that existed. There were only 12 of these who were specially gifted and called by Jesus, not only to plant churches, but also to establish those churches in the truth. Now, this is what Paul was. We know that after Judas, who was one of the original 12, betrayed Jesus, Jesus called Paul. We know there was another decision made by the apostles. There was a debate as to exactly what Matthias, what his position really was when they cast lots for him. But it appears as though our our Lord Jesus went out and found somebody else that he would commission personally and send to be his apostle. And so we read in Galatians 1.1, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, Paul will go on through the rest of chapter 1 and the whole of chapter 2 to defend his apostleship, how Jesus appeared to him and uh, gave him the gospel and gave him this commission, how when Jesus appeared to him, it transformed his life. Remember, he was devoting his life to the destruction of the church And how after he met the Lord Jesus and the Lord saved him, he was doing everything in his power to build it up. How the gospel that he was preaching, he, you know, was essentially, 
uh, given to him directly by Jesus. And he was preaching it even before he met the other apostles. And when he finally met up with them and they compared notes, they found out that he was preaching exactly the same gospel because it was given by exactly the same Lord. Uh, Paul goes on to tell us how at one time he even had to rebuke the pillar of the apostles, that is, Peter, because he was falling into exactly the same sin that the Galatians were being tempted into falling into, and that is behaving like a Jew and not embracing the Gentiles with that wall of partition still between them, uh, essentially the clean and unclean. Gentiles are unclean, so I'm going to side with the Jews. So Paul had a very strong claim to apostleship. But we do need to recognize here as well that that claim did not come from him alone. He also writes in verse 2, and all the brethren who are with me. You know, Jesus was once challenged by the Pharisees when he testified regarding himself, I am the light of the world. They said to him in John 8, verse 13, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. According to the law of God, if there was only one witness, you know, then what they said was not to be considered true. You were not bound necessarily to believe them. But Jesus goes on to say he was not alone in this testimony. In verses 17 and 18, he said this, even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. The way the Father did this, of course, was through the many miracles that he allowed Jesus to do, empowered Jesus to do. So Jesus was not testifying alone. He had a second witness, and the same thing is true here. Paul testifies of his call from Jesus and from the Father and of the message, but so do those who were with him. Because this was written, again, with not only his endorsement, but also those who were with him. The Galatians should listen, as we should as well, because Paul's message comes from Jesus. And it comes with Jesus' full authority. This is the Word of God. By the way, this past Wednesday, we were looking at um, R.C. Sproul talking about inerrancy and infallibility. Why should we believe it is? The Bible is inerrant and infallible. Because it is the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. It comes with his authority. We need to recognize Paul had that authority because he was sent by Jesus. And so after giving his customary apostolic greeting, and I want you to notice it's, it's a different greeting, a little bit fuller than the other letters because he's emphasizing and getting in early the gospel and how different it is than the Judaizers. He says in verses 3 and 4, Grace, and peace, uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Again, it is Jesus who saves us and Jesus alone. And that's why the Father should receive all the glory for it. He says in verse 5, to whom be the glory forever. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, so that God might receive all the glory alone. Sola Deo Gloria, remember. Not just the credit for the salvation, but also the devotion of our whole lives to Him because He is the one who has saved us. Well, having, uh, again, um, defended His apostleship, given Him this greeting, He begins to defend His gospel. First of all, He tells them in no uncertain terms that what they had heard from the Judaizers is not the gospel. It is not, it's, it's no gospel, right? Uh, he says in verses 6 and 7, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, over the past six weeks, we've been looking at exactly what the gospel is. And, and you know, the funny thing is we can, we can know these things, we can rehearse them, we can even teach them, and we can still not really believe them. So it's good for us to, to remember that justification, God's acceptance of us, our, what we consider to be our salvation, you know, that's the act of, of God 
justify in us that actually gives us eternal life. That is by God's grace alone. He does it all. It's a free gift. And we receive it through faith alone, which means we receive Jesus alone as our hope of heaven so that God alone might be honored. Okay, that is the gospel. But what the Judaizers were bringing was not the gospel simply because they added something to it. The Judaizers, as I've already mentioned, believed that Jesus was the Messiah. We needed his work. We needed his life, his obedience. We needed his death on the cross. We needed his resurrection. But we also needed something else. We needed circumcision. The, the sign of the Old Testament, the old, the old Covenant, and the Law of Moses, the traditions. As Luke wrote in Acts 15.1, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. They were adding circumcision to grace, you know, grace of God through faith alone. Now, obviously, Paul didn't agree because to receive circumcision was to fall into works. You're adding works. If you add works, you're falling away from grace. You're falling away from Jesus alone. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 5, verses 2 through 4. Pretty heavy words. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. What's the problem with adding circumcision? Well, because you are seeking to be justified by keeping the law. You are adding works to salvation. If we start down the road of working for our salvation, Paul says we have to do all of it, okay? Adding works destroys grace. Remember Romans 11, verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. To put it simply, Jesus does it all, or we have to do it all. Okay, there, there's nothing in between. And, and of course, the, the bad news is we can't do it all. We can't do anything. So Jesus has to do it all. So if we take a part of it, We've got to take the whole of it, and we are lost. Now, again, what does this say about Rome? Well, they're guilty of the same things as the Judaizers, right? They added works, and we saw what all those works were. They, they added works as the way to get grace. Okay, no, the grace is free, but you've got to work for the grace. Well, again, they've, they've intruded works into the whole system, and so they have destroyed grace. But I think you understand from what Paul is saying here, but that's not the only way you can distort and destroy the gospel. I mean, how many times have you gone to this verse when somebody has shown up at your door with, with a different passage, you know, or with a different, with a different gospel, right? Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, I had one come to the door one time, and I asked what their message was, and I, ha I asked for everything they had to give me. And when they were done, I said, well, let me, let me tell you, because it was all works. You join our organization, right? You go door to door with us. You study the Bible with us. And then when you die, you'll get to be in paradise. And I said, is that it? Is that all there is to, to be in paradise? I just have to join your organization and work with you? That's all. That's it. Well, let me show you what the Bible says about that. And so I, I read the 1 Corinthians 15 passage where Paul describes what the gospel is. And then I read Galatians 1 about what the Lord thinks about those who bring a different gospel. I said, you brought a different gospel. You, according to this passage, are accursed. Now, their problem is they added works, but they also, they added other things too, and they distorted the gospel in other ways, and there are other ways of destroying it, such as believing in any other God is, you know, than the true God also destroys the gospel. Listen to what the Lord says in Isaiah 45, verses 22 through 23. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. Who can save? 
Only the true God. We've got to make sure we have the true God. By the way, did you notice that second part, that second verse? Have you, have you heard that apply to anyone else? Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. It's applied to Jesus in the New Testament where Paul is telling us that Jesus is the true God who saves. So there is only one true God, and that true God is three in person. And if somebody doesn't believe that that is true about God, they worship another God, and that is virtually true of every false religion and every Christian cult. They have all distorted the, the, uh, well, the definition of who the true God is. They are not worshiping the true God. It's also important that we believe in the true Jesus. And if we believe in a Jesus who isn't God as well as man, we've destroyed the gospel again. I mean, listen to what Jesus said to the Jews in John 8, 24. He says, therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now, it's not just I mean, that I am he, who, he who. Uh, he is, is added by the translators. That I'm the Messiah? Well, that's part of it. But the Jews understood what Jesus was saying. As a matter of fact, at the end of this discourse, they picked up rocks to throw at him because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Okay, that's what Jesus was claiming to be. And he says, unless you believe that I am, that I am Yahweh, you will die in your sins. You have to believe in a Jesus who is both God and man, the eternal Son of God, who became man for us and for our salvation. Now, we've already seen that adding works to the gospel destroys it, but, you know, adding the idea that, that you can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and have your life completely unchanged, having a faith that doesn't produce a change of life or produce works, that doesn't make us like Jesus, that also destroys the gospel. James tells us in James 2.26, faith without works is dead, and dead faith cannot save us. So any of these things distorts or destroys the gospel. And if you destroy the gospel, if you have a gospel that is no gospel, that gospel cannot save you. So if we want to be saved, we need to make sure that we are listening to what Paul says here. We need to make sure we're listening to Jesus as he speaks to us through his word given us by the apostles and we receive the word from them and do not change what they have said. But there's another question that's, that rises here. What about those who actually are distorting the gospel? That's one thing we didn't even talk about during the Reformation, did we? But we see what Paul said about them in verses 8 and 9. He says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we've said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Paul's essentially saying if those who listen to false teachers end up being ruined, remember, if you add circumcision, you've got to keep the whole law, you've fallen from grace, you can't be saved. If those who listen to them end up being ruined, how much more will the false teachers end up being ruined for their false teaching? James writes in James chapter 3, verse 1, Let not many of you become teachers. We heard about this yesterday as well. My brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. Now, this stricter judgment uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be more stringent on the day of, of, of um, you know, God's judgment, but it means you will receive a greater or the greatest condemnation or punishment if you claim to be a teacher and you're teaching things that are false. Now, we need to make sure that we take, take this, you know, to heart and that if we're going to, to, you know, teach somebody or communicate the gospel, we need to make sure that we get that gospel right. We, don't, we want to make sure that we don't do what the false teachers are doing. But Paul is also telling us here we need to avoid those who are preaching a false gospel and realize the condition that they're in. They are accursed. I mean, they're going to be cursed on the day of judgment, but they're to be considered accursed even now, cursed by God. Anathema is the word that's used in the, in the Greek. We need to make sure that we're careful around them, uh, and we also need, of course, warn those whom we know that might be listening to them. Now, as I was thinking about what Paul had to say here, we do need to realize that sometimes God does save some of these people, right? Right? 
not all teachers, false teachers, are going to be destroyed. Uh, the Lord has those who are his. I mean, what was Paul before his conversion? He was a Pharisee. He was a teacher of the law, and he was teaching a false gospel. He was worse than the Judaizers because he was saying, Jesus is a criminal who deserved to die, and you need to keep the law and you need to be circumcised to be saved, okay? Well, the Judaizers at least accepted Jesus, but what, what they're doing was still equally bad, but Paul was saved, okay? So false teachers can be saved. Uh, I met a man one time who was a Jehovah's Witness for most of his life. He was in his late 50s. He had been uh, basically teaching, uh, I think he was head over 15 kingdom halls in Great Britain. His wife, his whole family, everybody he knew was a part of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Somebody witnessed to him, he was saved. And he lost his job, he, lost, he would have lost his wife if she hadn't been converted because everybody shuns you when you leave that particular religion. Uh, he would have lost it all, but he was able to take uh, at least part of his family out of there, and he virtually had to start over. But he was a teacher of false doctrine for most of his life, teaching even several kingdom halls, and yet the Lord had mercy on him. And I think we'll find examples in Rome, in Islam, in Mormonism, and even among the religion that is secularism or atheistic, that's still a religion, and they still have their good news. You know, the good news is when you die, you go into nothingness. Uh, it's still a religion. It's still a belief. It's still a false gospel. But people have been saved from that too, even those who have been, you know, preaching it strongly. Maybe even Dawkins. I mean, Dawkins may be capable of um, salvation if he hasn't crossed the line. There is a line that can be crossed from which there is no return. But if he hasn't crossed that line, there's still hope. So it doesn't mean, of course, that um, every one of them is going to be destroyed. But we do need to understand that while they are about teaching their false doctrine, that that is a very serious sin. And Paul says that we must consider them accursed. So pray for them and be wary of them. And then finally, Paul, through his own example, calls us to be willing to defend the truth. And think about what Paul says in verse 10. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still striving to please men... I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Now, think about all the, the, the teachers, even within the evangelical church, that sadly have fallen into the pattern of men pleasing. And a lot of religions, the reasons why they go for works is because they know that panders after man's pride. They, they, people like to believe they've contributed something to their salvation so they can pat themselves on the back and say, that was a job well done. I deserve to enter into heaven. I can think, you know, more highly about myself. No, the Lord says we have to humble ourselves to the dust and realize there's nothing good in us, and we have to receive Jesus alone. We are called not to be men-pleasers and not even self-pleasers, but we are called to be pleasers of God. But to do that, we need to stand up for the gospel, as Paul did in a world that hates the gospel, in a world that believes the lie, we have to be willing to be considered a curse by the world in order to serve our Lord Jesus. And certainly, if we have God's Spirit living within us, which we do if we are believers, His Spirit is moving us to do that very thing. He's moving us to commit ourselves completely to the Lord Jesus as His servants. Remember when we took up the charge of Christ we took up his cross, we became his bondservants, we will do what our Lord calls us to do. We'll realize that this isn't going to make us popular. You know, we will not be popular in the eyes of the world just as Paul was not making himself popular necessarily among the Galatians. They had adopted what the Judaizers had said. If Paul wanted to be popular with them, he would just simply agree with them. If he wanted to be popular with the vast majority of the Jews, he would just simply agree with them. But he was willing to stand out. He was willing to please God rather than man, and it was going to make him unpopular. And he wants them to know that. I'm not seeking the favor of men. I'm seeking the favor of God as Christ's bondservant. So doing the same is not going to make us popular in the world's eyes, Jesus says. The world will hate us as it hates him, but it will make us um, popular in God's eyes, you see. And that is really what is most important. You know, Jesus 
could have led the Jews in a revolt against Rome if he wanted to be popular among the Jews. He could have done that. They were all looking to him as the, the Messiah, and that was their concept of the Messiah, that he was going to save them from Rome through some type of, of political and military effort. But the table reminds us this morning that that's not what Jesus was seeking. He was not after pleasing men. He was not trying to get them to like him. He was wanting to honor his father. And by honoring his father, it meant that men were going to hate him and that this was actually going to take place. But that's what Jesus wanted because that's what the father sent him into the world to do, to lay down his life for us so that we might have life. And now Jesus calls us also to take up our crosses and to lay down our lives for him so that we might also serve and honor him in the eyes of the world. So as we think about um, these things, uh, being a Christian is not going to make us popular. It's going to make us contrary to the world. Let's think about whether we're willing to pay that price. Because if we're going to come to the table, we have to be willing. We have to be willing to die with our Lord Jesus Christ. When we came to him, we actually did die with him. We are no longer alive. We were raised again from the dead now to serve him. We no longer live. Remember what Paul says again in Galatians. You know, I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live basically by his grace and for his glory and not for, not for my own glory. He says, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That is what our Lord calls us to. So let's bow, shall we, for just a moment of prayer. And let's ask the Lord to give us um, the grace to prepare to come to the table, that we might come with this kind of heart, this kind of commitment, and be willing to give ourselves to him for whatever his purposes may be.